Well, hello, boys and girls. Welcome to Storytime. This week, we continue on with our story, Dangerous Journey. Remember, we have learned about Christian and the journey that he has taken to leave the city of destruction and go to the celestial city. Remember that he had to travel through the slough of despond, that mucky mire that he almost got caught in and almost took him down. But he was able to get up and get out and continue on his journey to the celestial city. Oh, he had distractions and trials along the way. But do you remember that giant burden he had upon his back? And he discovered how simple it was for him to be relieved of that burden. Do you remember what he had to do? All he had to do was gaze upon the cross. And in gazing upon the cross, the burden was lifted. It was removed and he felt oh so very free. Today, we're going to pick up with our dangerous journey and we will begin with chapter three. Chapter three, The High Hill of Difficulty. Well, I think that title already tells us what kind of journey he is going to have. A very, very difficult journey. So let us begin. As Christian now set off again, free of his burden and light of foot, suddenly to the left of him, two strangers jumped over the wall and came at him apace. The name of the one was formalist and the name of the other hypocrisy. Gentlemen, asked Christian, where have you come from? And where are you going? We were born in the land of vainglory, and we are on our way to the heavenly city, they replied. Then why did you jump over the wall instead of coming through the narrow, wicked gate? Did you not know that he who climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber? It's a long way around to the wicked gate answered formalists and hypocrisy. Our countrymen always take this short cut. They've been doing it for hundreds of years, so it can't be wrong. But it's breaking the rules of the journey. What's it matter how we did it, said the two men. If we are in, we are in. I walk by the rule of my master. You follow your own fancies. Christian answered. To this they gave him no answer, only they looked up each other and laughed, ha, ha, ha. So they continued on their way, the three of them together. I beheld then that they reached a crossroads. One broad road turned to the left, another broad road turned to the right, while the narrow road went straight on up the great black hill called difficulty. Which one would they choose? Formalist chose to go to the left, which led him into a dark wood. Did he but know it, the road was called danger, and he lost his way forever. Hypocrisy chose to go on to the right, which led him into rough ground, full of holes and hummocks. Did he but know it, the road was called destruction. Here he stumbled and fell and rose no more. As for Christian, he paused and drank at a spring to refresh himself. Then, after looking both ways, he started briskly, straight on up the high hill of difficulty. But soon he was wondering, had he chosen wisely? For he went from running to walking, from walking to clamoring, and now he was on his hands and knees because of the steepness of the place. Then, just as he was about to give up, 
Midway to the top of the hill, he espied a pleasant arbor made by the Lord of the hill for the refreshing of weary travelers. Here Christian gratefully sat down to rest and pulling out the parchment, which the shining one had given him, he read it to his comfort. He also looked with admiration at the embroidered coat, which had been given him as he stood by the cross. Thus pleasing himself a while in the drowsy warmth of the afternoon sun, he first fell into a slumber and then into a fast sleep. Do you see Christian sleeping at the arbor? When he woke, it was late evening. So he quickly rose up and hastened on his way. Then, coming towards him, he heard the sound of running feet, and out of the twilight two men appeared. The name of one was Timorous, and the other Mistrust. Sirs, what's the matter? asked Christian. He run the wrong way. It's true, we were going to the heavenly city, and had climbed the hill of difficulty, said Timorous. But the further we went, the more danger we met. Therefore we turned and are going back. There were these two lions in the way, added Mistrust. Whether asleep or awake, we knew not, but we agreed that if we came within reach, they could tear us into pieces. So saying, Timorous and Mistrust ran on down the hill, leaving Christian much perplexed. For he now said to himself, if I go forward, I shall perish. Likewise, if I go back to my own country, I shall perish. What am I to do? Then he remembered his parchment and felt for it under his coat. It always had been a help and comfort to him. But though he felt everywhere, he couldn't find it. He must have dropped it. And it should have been his passport, without which he could not enter the celestial city. As so often happens in dreams, that which he dreaded most had come to pass. He had no choice. He must go back. So sighing deeply and chiding himself for being such a fool, he retraced his steps, looking on this side and that. It was growing darker all the time, and the night was full of whispers and unearthly sounds, dark though it was. When he reached the arbor, God directed his eye to the place where the parchment lay. It must have slipped from him while he was asleep. With great joy, he picked it up, but then he cried. Oh, dear I have trod the same road three times, which, is, which I should have trod but once. How far might I have been by now upon my way? How truly feared that he would be benighted. O oh, thou sinful sleep, he cried, for thy sake I must walk without the sun. He also remembered how mistrust and timorous had been frightened by the lions. These beasts, he said to himself, Seek their prey by night, and if they should meet me in the dark, how should I escape them? And again he asked himself, what shall I do? There was still light enough to read his parchment, and this is what he read. Desire now a better country, that is, the heavenly one. And with these words to strengthen him, Christian resumed his climb. Lifting up his eyes, he saw against the sky the towers of a stately palace, the palace beautiful. Here, perhaps, he thought, they'll give me lodgings for the night. So I say in my dream that he made greater haste. But as he drew near, he could hear in the darkness the roaring of lions. The only way forward was along a narrow passage, which is about a furlong from the porter's lodge. 
This, he knew, was the place from which mistrust and Tamoris had fled, and Christian was never so near to running back after them. But the porter at the lodge, whose name was Watchful, perceiving now that Christian made a halt, cried out, Is your strength so small? Fear not the lions. They are on long chains. If you keep streakly to the beam of light in the center of the path, they cannot reach you. So Christian moved on. He took good heed to the directions of the porter. At the same time, he trembled for fear of the lions. For now, they were on either side of him, straining at their chains and how they roared and snapped at him and how they tried to catch him by the foot. Do you see the lions? He's walking straight on that narrow beam of light to reach the porter. But Christian soldiered on boldly, and in another minute he was through and had reached the gate unharmed. Then, somewhat breathlessly, he asked the porter, Sir, may I lodge here for the night? That depends, he said, looking at him suspiciously. What's your name and what is your business? My name is Christian. I am from the city of destruction and am going to the heavenly city. But how does it happen that you come so late? Asked the porter. The sun is set. I have been here sooner, but wretched man that I am, I slept in the arbor that stands on the hillside, Christian explained. And there I dropped my parchment and came without it to the brow of the hill. Then filling for it and finding it not, I was forced to go back for it. Well, that's a sorry tale, to be sure, said the porter. But I will summon one of the young ladies that live here. If she likes your talk, she may bring you to, in to the rest of the family. Or, contrarywise, she may not. What does she do? So watchful, the porter rang the bell, and there appeared the sound of it, a grave and beautiful damsel called Discretion. She questioned him closely, asking him what he had seen and met with in the way, and he told her. So she smiled, but the tears stood in her eyes, and after a little pause, she said to his relief, We have to be careful whom we admit here. But this house was built by the Lord of the Hill for the benefit of pilgrims. So, with the Lord's blessing, come in. Then he bowed his head and followed her into the house. And when she saw her and her sisters had made ready, they sat down to meet. After supper, they committed themselves to their Lord for protection and then betook themselves to rest. Christian, they laid in a large upper chamber whose windows opened toward the sun rising and the name of the chamber was peace. So for a little while, Christian was safe and much he needed to renew his strength for on the morrow, though he knew it not, he had to fight the foul fiend, Apollyon. So for tonight, he gets to enjoy a wonderful night's rest. But in the morning, he would have to fight Apollyon. And that will bring us to chapter four. Okay, let us continue with chapter four, the fight with Apollyon. You ready for the fight? Then I saw in my dream that on the morrow, Christian desired to go forward on his journey. But the ladies of the house, whose names were Charity, Piety, Prudence, and Discretion, told him that he should not depart thence till they had shown him the rarities of the palace. 
For if the day be clear, they said, we will show you the delectable mountains. So he consented and stayed. And when morning was up, they took him to the roof of the palace. Look to the south, they said. So he did. And behold, the mountains in the sunlight were indeed delectable and beautified with the woods. From the top of these mountains, they told him, you may see the gate of the celestial city. This greatly encouraged him. Yet in truth, the city was still a long way off, and the journey, as we know, had all to be done on foot. So once again, Christian desired to be going, but once again, they detained him. Now it was the turn of Charity to question him. Have you a family? asked Charity. Are you a married man? I have a wife and four small children, Christian replied. Then why didn't you bring them along with you? to share in your felicity, she questioned. At this, our traveler began to weep. Oh, how willingly I would have done so. But they were all of them averse to going on pilgrimage. My wife was afraid of losing the comforts of this world, and my children were given to the foolish delights of youth. So what with one thing and another to my great great grief they would not come from all that had befallen him so far you may think he did prudently to make the journey first alone the other damsels said as much but still they would not let him go till they had led him to the armory where they showed him some of the objects with which the servants of the lord had done wonderful things they showed him moses's rod the hammer and nail with which Jael slew Sisera, the pitchers, trumpets, and lamps too, with which Gideon put to flight the armies of Midian. They showed him also the jawbone of the donkey, with which Samson did such mighty deeds. And they showed him the sling and the stone, with which David slew Goliath. Then they fitted Christian out with the armor, which their Lord provided for the use of travelers, that they should be ready for any assaults along the way, and that they should stand their ground when things were at their worst, and having done all to stand, first the helmet and breastplate that could save his life, then the faithful shield to fend off the fiery darts of the wicked, then the trusty sword that could cut through anything, Finally, his feet were shod with the shoes that would never wear out, for he was setting out, they said, not against human foes, but against the wiles of the devil. Do you see Christian getting fitted in his armor for his journey? And what do we see on this page? Christian with his shield and sword. Against, do you remember his name? Apollyon the dragon. Thus fully armed did Christian hurry to the gate, and there he asked the porter, Have you seen any other pilgrim pass this way? The porter answered, Yes. Pray, did you know him? asked Christian. I asked him his name, and he told me it was faithful. He is my townsman, My near neighbor, Christian explained. He comes from the place where I was born. How far do you think he is ahead of me? By this time, he will be below the hill, answered the porter. Well, good porter, the Lord be with you. If I hasten, I may catch up with him. He was not to overtake his friend that day. Instead, he found himself in a solitary valley called the Valley of of humiliation. Here, after he had stopped to partake of the bread and wine and raisins which the damsels had given him, he was feeling well content. Perhaps, he said to myself, the worst is over. All of a sudden, a darkness fell across the sun. What could it be? He roused himself, and there he saw stalking towards him the towering shape of a foul fiend. 
He was at least nine feet high. And the nearer he came, the more hideous he grew. He had scales like a fish. And they are his pride. He had wings like a dragon and feet like a bear. And out of his belly came fire and smoke. As happens in a dream, Christian recognized the fiend at once and knew his name. It was Apollyon. Terrified, he cast in his mind whether to go back or stay firm. Then considering that he had no armor on his back and to turn his back to the monster would give him the advantage, he resolved to stay firm. The fiend had now drawn very close. He looked upon Christian with a disdainful countenance and thus began to question him. Where have you come from? I've come from the city of destruction, which is the place of all evil. By this I perceive that you are one of my subjects, said Apollyon, for I am the prince of that city, and all that country is mine. Why then are you running away from your prince? I was indeed born in your dominions, admitting Christian, but I have given my allegiance to another, who is the king of princes. How can I now with fairness go back on this? You did the same to me, and yet I am willing to pass it over, replied Apollyon. What I promised you was in my infancy, said Christian. Besides, to tell you the truth, I like his service better than yours. You have already been unfaithful to him, explained Apollyon. You fell in the slough of despond. You slept and let fall your parchment. And in all you say and do, you are inwardly desirous of vain glory. Too well I know it. Yet the king who I serve is merciful and ready to forgive. I am the enemy of this king, said Apollyon. I hate his person, I hate his laws, and I hate his people. Moreover, there is no prince who will lightly lose his subjects. Neither will I lose you. Give him the slip and work for me, and your wages shall be doubled. I know your wages. You destroying Apollyon, they are not such as a man can live on. They are wages of death. Then Apollyon broke into a grievous rage. What you say is true. Therefore, prepare yourself to die. Apollyon, beware what you're doing, cried Christian, for I am on the king's highway, the way of holiness. Therefore, take heed yourself. But Apollyon straddled over the whole breadth of the way and barred his path. What shall happen? I am void of fear of this matter. I swear by my infernal den that you shall go no further. Here will I spill your soul. Without more ado, the fiend threw a flaming dart at Christian's breast. But Christian had his shield in his hand and so prevented him. Then Christian drew his sword, for he saw it was the time to bestir himself. And the fiend made fast at him and threw his darts as thick as hail. And though he did all he could to avoid them, and in spite of the new armor that he wore, Christian was wounded in the head, the hand, the foot and forced to yield ground. But he still resisted as manfully as he could, hoping perhaps some other traveler would hear the clash of arms and come to his assistance. But any within earshot were too cowardly to fight. They made a wide detour rather than encounter such a fiend. The combat now had lasted half the day. You couldn't imagine if you had been there what yelling and roaring Apollyon made, and what sighs and groans 
burst from the pilgrim's heart. For you must know that, by reason of his wounds, Christian was growing weaker by the hour. Then Apollyon saw his chance and came in close, and wrestling with Christian gave him such a dreadful fall that his sword flew from his hand. Now I am sure of you, the fiend cried, and kneeling on him, as he lay helplessly upon his back, he pressed him near to death. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was preparing his final blow, thereby to make an end of this good man, Christian nimbly stretched out his hand for his sword and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, when I fall, I shall rise. With that, he ran Apollyon through, and with a wound, the fiend drew back. Then, for the first time, Christian smiled. For looking up, he saw Apollyon spread his dragon wings and fly away dripping blood over the fields as he went. So the battle was over, and Christian offered thanks for his deliverance. But he, too, was bleeding copiously, and if he was to bleed to death, his victory would have been in vain. Then in his mercy, God directed him towards a certain tree, the tree of life, the leaves of which he now applied to all his wounds. They staunched the flow of blood, and he was healed immediately. He also sat down in that place to eat and drink, and so refreshed, Christian went forward to the valley's end. He left his heavy armor there, but kept his sword still drawn in his hand. For all I know, he said, some other enemy lies even now in wait for me. Indeed, far worse things lay ahead of him, worse even than his combat with the fiend, Apollyon. Wow, what a battle and what a struggle. So much like the life of every Christian. There are battles and there are struggles. But we have our spiritual army armor. We have our sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation that we must use like Christian did so that we too can be victorious. Next week, we'll continue the story of dangerous journey as we discover the valley of the shadow of death. Until next time, may God be with you and may you be victorious.